No, I got this one here. Thank you. How are you? What a joy to see you here. And again, we're honored that you've come to, uh, to be a part of this conference. Um, I am the assistant pastor of the church, and my, my principal assignment here in portfolio is the day-to-day -day operation of the church. I serve on the revival staff, but um, really uh, my job is um, the, the church, the day-to-day -day operation of the church. We have 137 employees, and um, they're my responsibility as well. The budget is my responsibility. The ministries of the church are my responsibilities. And uh, uh, in my spare time, uh, I do other things for pleasure. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's such a joy to be here. I was... Um, I uh, was happily pastoring a church in Georgia as a senior pastor where Pastor Ty served on my staff, uh, the gentleman who introduced me, and uh, he has called me some bad names in times past. I was happy there, and um, in 1994, December, God spoke to me and said, you are finished here, um, and uh, so we began to transition out of the church. We, it was a large church with five uh, other ministers on staff, and so we began to transition out and decided after a much prayer that we would come back to Pensacola because we'd spent our last three and a half years in the Navy here and uh, had attended this church and uh, had preached here many times and uh, become close friends with John and Brenda Kilpatrick. And so we uh, came back to Pensacola to retire, really. Uh, I turned 62 that year, uh, 1995, and I, we came down in May uh, and I bought a house, on, I bought a lot on the golf course up here at Marcus Point, the very nicest golf course in Pensacola. My intention was to retire and play golf the rest of my life. Just suffer for Jesus, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, we did that in May, and we came by the church after we'd closed on the lot and um, uh, told John and Brenda that we were retiring, come back to Pensacola, and he said, oh, great, I'm, I need you. And I said, well, I'm not, to, I'm not coming back to go to work. I'm coming to uh, retire. And he said, well, you're coming to Brownsville, aren't you? And I said, oh, yeah. I'll come and, um, you know, I'll drive you around to your speaking engagements and I'll drink coffee with you and you can ventilate on me and I'll take it out on the church and um, um, I'll carry your bags, uh, you know, to, to meetings and so forth. But I said, I'm not going to work. I'm going to play golf. And uh, he said, well, I'm just glad that you're going to be here because we, as I said, had become close friends uh, through, during the three and a half years that I was here. And um, so um, we, um, we made the, the move and... Um, the thing that we didn't understand when we were sitting talking in May of 95 was that we were in about 45 days of this momentous revival. Had we known that it was coming, uh, he probably would have resigned and I would have moved some other place. Um, but um, well, thankfully we didn't know and um, so we've been tremendously blessed because in our ignorance we did not understand what God was about to do. And uh, so I came into the revivals powerfully touched right off and for three months, I um, lay on the floor over there with my nose in the carpet. And um, God was taking pride and arrogance out of me and professionalism in ministry and um, controlling and uh, various and other sundry sins that um, had crept into my life and uh, my way of doing things uh, through training and experiences in life. I had um, become pretty self-sufficient and, um, and capable of doing things on my own. And God reminded me while I was... Uh, laying under pews over there with my nose in the carpet and looking at bubble gum stuck under the bottom of the seats, that uh, he was God and he was the creator and I was the createe. And um, he also um, invited me to take myself off the committee to manage the universe. <laughs> I had placed myself on the committee and he invited me to take myself off. And I did and what a liberation it was. I discovered while laying under a pew over there that I was no longer uh, responsible for Jan Crouch and her three pieces of hair and long eyelashes. <laughs> and I was not accountable to Benny, uh, for Benny Hinn's um, uh, ministry nor Rodney Howard Brown uh, and the Snickers that would go on there. I just wasn't accountable for any of that stuff anymore and what a load was lifted off me that I no longer had, had to supervise those people. And um, uh, really, God um, uh, caused me to be born again again. And then I started doing evangelistic work. Got calls and started going out all over the country doing evangelistic work. And uh, so I'd fly out on Saturday morning and preach uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fly back in here on Thursday morning, be in revival Thursday night, Friday night, and fly out again on Saturday morning. 
I did that for a year. And um, God was just blessing uh, my socks off, and I was having a great time. You know, evangelists have it made. They just blow in, blow up, and blow out. <laughs> and, um, and I was sick of pastoring. I had been uh, beat up and sheep bit about all I wanted. And uh, so I never intended to go back in pastoral work, man. I was just going to get out there and, and just blow up and go on. And um, John found out I was having fun. And so... Uh, <laughs> So he nailed my feet to the floor here and, um, and put me to work. Um, when, he, when he asked me to come on board, I, I gave him the classic Pentecostal response, when you don't want to do something, I'll pray about it. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, you don't have to, I've already prayed. <laughs> so I said, well, if you don't mind, I will pray. And, um, Really, I, I didn't have to because, I, you know, I, God had already nailed me, and, uh, and I was sick, absolutely sick. Uh, and here I am. He, um, he took me across the street from uh, the lounge over there in the, in the main sanctuary to his office, and he said, this office is going to become your office. Here are the keys. There's a parking space out front, says Pastor, that's um, stenciled in the, the asphalt. That's yours. Here's a telephone number. When you need me, call me. And he walked out. And that's the way it's been. <laughs> so I have his cell number and, um, and we talk and um, he tells and I do. <laughs> he, he's he's the, the gun that points and I'm the guy that pulls the trigger. And um, so that's, that's my position here, how I got here and, um, and um, what I'm doing. And I have to tell you that um, when I took over here uh, to run the day-to-day -day operation of the church, we, um, we were going through some very difficult times because we were having a tremendous revival, but we were destroying a church. Um, when the, the revival hit, uh, some of our people were offended, some of the key people, and they left. And um, other key people uh, in the infrastructure um, began to enjoy revival and forgot that they had responsibilities. And uh, that had been going on for a year when I got a little better than a year. And so when I got here, uh, the infrastructure of the church was basically uh, gone. And so uh, what I've been doing the last uh, three and a half years basically is putting an infrastructure back together and we about have it. Our mission statement for the church is, um, um, I'll just show it to you, it's very simple. Our mission statement, uh, you might, uh, it's bigger than that. <laughs> our mission statement is reclamation, restoration, and reproduction. And our goal is to reclaim the broken, battered, bruised, bored, and restore them to wholeness and equip believers to reproduce themselves uh, by reaching others. And um, so in order to do that, uh, what, we're do, what we have done is we've restructured the church uh, to the Ephesians uh, 4 uh, mentality uh, and we considered our uh, responsibility to uh, train people for the work of the ministry. And so when people become members of this church, they're told in my orientation class, you're not here for a free ride. You are here to go to work. You're not going to sit in this can canoe and somebody else row it and you sit and watch the scenery and gripe and complain about everything that goes on. You are going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution. And if you're a part of the problem, we will invite you to leave. And so um, we, uh, we have devised a system whereby we train people and uh, we call it running a base path. Um, the Assemblies of God put out a uh, thing called We Build People and used a baseball diamond uh, motif. So we took that and um, we adapted that to our situation. And so in order to bring a person and train a person for one of those four uh, areas of service down at the bottom there, which is intercessory prayer over the city, community outreach, cleansing stream, and grace groups, uh, people must run the base pass. And the first uh, thing they must do is they must come into church membership and the event at first base is our reception of them into church membership. To get from first to second, they must be in a group and they must go through cleansing stream, which I'm gonna talk about today. 
The event on second base is the Cleansing Stream Retreat. We'll be having a regional retreat here on uh, December 3rd and 4th, just less than a month from now. <clears throat> In order to get from third, second base to third base, they must go through Cleansing Discipleship, which is another level of Cleansing Stream, and the event on third base is a Giftings Retreat. We teach them uh, giftings uh, in cleansing discipleship, and um, we test them to find out what their giftings are. Every believer is gifted, and since they're gifted, we believe that God gave them that gift in order to use that gift for the blessing of the kingdom of God, the restoration, and the things we said in our mission statement. And uh, then in order to go from third base uh, to home plate, they must be in a group and complete the leadership training course, which we have designed. And once they've done that, then we will release them into ministry in one of the four areas uh, of ministry in the church, or more than one if they uh, have enough stamina to do that. Uh, you have to understand that we're in revival here, and so five nights a week um, our church is basically open. Tuesday night we have intercessory prayer, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday uh, we have the revival services and then Sunday morning, so we're open uh, almost seven days a week. Monday is the only, the only day that the church, uh, there's no activity going on here. And usually there's something going on in here um, or some training going on in some, some uh, aspect. But we expect everyone to serve. And of course, uh, one of the great problems with the church has been that we've asked people to serve who were neither trained nor capable. And consequently, we get frustrated with them. They get frustrated with themselves. And uh, the work of the kingdom suffers. And so... Uh, some years ago, I was uh, two or three years ago, I got three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, I was in Saginaw, Michigan uh, doing a pastor's conference and it was hosted by a college classmate of mine who we had, um, uh, I graduated a year before him and um, went on to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary for my, um, my theology degree and uh, he went to or ORU and we'd lost contact for about 25 years. And um, he had heard about the revival, heard that I was on staff. He'd come down and invited me to come to his church and do a pastor's conference. And so while I was there, I noticed um, a level of um, uh, maturity in his leadership. And I asked him what he did to train his leaders because I had just come on staff here and was wrestling with um, how we were going to develop uh, the infrastructure of our church leadership-wise. And he told me about Cleansing Stream. Uh, Cleansing Stream Ministry was developed by Jack Hayford's ministry out in uh, Van Nuys, California. And, um, and uh, so my friend said, I'll give you a, the, the whole Cleansing Stream program, everything. And you can take it back and, um, and look at it and, and tell me what you think. So I brought it back here. And as I began to look at it, I realized that I had preached a series of six sermons uh, in my previous pa uh, pastoral uh, role that were exactly along the same lines of uh, Cleansing Stream. Uh, I didn't call it Cleansing Stream, I called it something else, but um, it was the exact same concept. In fact, when I looked at it, I told my wife, I said, these guys in California stole my, my series of messages. And my wife said, it's in the Bible, Carrie, and that belongs to everybody. <laughs> and um, so they were smart enough to put it in um, a concise, organized form, and um, um, so there you go, cleansing stream. And so uh, I put myself through it the way they had it uh, written and, and uh, the way they had it organized. Took it to John Kilpatrick and I said, John, we've got to, we've got to do this. And he said, well, uh, let me look at it. And he looked at it and he said, well, how do you want to do it? And I said, I want to put the leadership through first. So he said, okay. So I contacted all the leadership and I told them that they were going through cleansing stream. And um, they did not like it. As a matter of fact, hell jumped right out of them at me, which indicated we needed cleansing stream. <laughs> and so um, they started writing cards and letters to John and making telephone calls. And, um, and um, so he called me in one night before revival. He said, I'm getting cards and letters and telephone calls on you. And I said, yeah, I know. I'm getting them too. And... Um, so he said, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, what do you mean what I want to do? You're the pastor. What do you want to do? And um, he said, well, you want to put up with all this stuff? And I said, well, I want these guys through cleansing stream. And so he said, okay, do it. And so I called them together and I said, uh, listen, here's the deal, guys. You're going through cleansing stream or you're going to lose your position. 
I'm not here to negotiate. I'm not here to form a study committee. I'm not here to do anything but lay down an ultimatum. You're going through cleansing stream and you're out of a job. Take your choice. So I drug our leadership kicking and screaming in the cleansing stream. And um, six weeks later, those that opposed me came to me and, and actually began to hug my neck because it had made such an impact on their families until they, they just were blown away by it. So we put 196 people through our first class and word got out and the second class we did 500. The third class we did 750. Uh, the next class I think we had 1100 in it and um, so it's gone on from there. Now it is a required course in our Bible college. And um, basically um, Cleansing Stream is taking us back to the basics. This whole conference is about back to basics. And you heard last night the cry and the heart of an evangelist. But you know one thing evangelists don't understand is that once you get people saved, intellectually I think they do, but experientially they don't know anything about beyond the altar. Uh, and that's not critical. You know, God has one of the fivefold ministries is evangelist. And thank God um, evangelists are not pastors. If they were, they would absolutely annihilate churches. I go around shoveling up after Steve Hill all the time. Uh, because he just levels church people, you know. He's an evangelist. And, um, and um, uh, so you heard the cry last night of an evangelist's heart. But the real work with a person is not to get them saved. That is a relatively simple task. Not real easy, but relatively simple when compared to what happens after they become a Christian, which is discipleship. You've got to take them on from there. Jesus in Matthew 28 said, go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say make converts. He said make disciples. Now it would stand to reason that if you're going to make a disciple, you have to make a convert first. And so, uh, uh, you know, Jesus said, um, uh, go and preach the, uh, the word to all nations, and that's easy. Bring people to faith, and whoever believes you baptize them, that's easy. But the real work begins uh, when the preaching, reaching, and baptism is over. And Matthew reminds us that we're not just to make converts, but to make these disciples. And discipleship involves a lot of things. It involves, for instance, helping a person understand what happened to them at salvation. Discipleship involves helping them understand who they are in Christ. It um, uh, involves teaching them about church membership and the reasons for church membership teaches them about tithing and about serving in a tangible way. Discipleship is about witnessing and how to live a holy life. And it is in this area of how to live a holy life that Cleansing Stream fits. And uh, here's why it is so absolutely needed in the church today. If you'll open your syllabus to um, page 61, you'll find the outline of my presentation to you. Here is the reason Cleansing Stream is so absolutely necessary in the discipling process. The present state of carnality in the church. Folks, whether you want to believe it or I want to believe it or whether we want to admit it, we have carnal churches. And the reason we have carnal churches is because our people are carnal. And it isn't all their fault. You know, it's easy for us to stand and, and point an ecclesiastical finger at the people that sit in the pew. But I'm going to tell you, friends, most of the responsibility for the carnality in the church does not lie in the pew. It lies in the pulpit. And so uh, we have to deal with this carnality or it is going to take the church under. Pastor and I had lunch together a while ago in the lounge and we were talking about this very issue of carnality in the church. And, um, and he said, how can these things be in the church, we were talking about a specific situation that we just had to deal with yesterday. And I said, Pastor, let me tell you the reason revival is not in the land. The reason revival is not in the land is because there is all this carnality in the church. And um, uh, so, you know, we, we have to deal with that. And of course, when we look at the carnality in the church, we have to ask ourselves two questions. Are these people, are these people carnal because they're un unsaved or are they carnal because they're unable or don't know how to live a spiritual life. 
Well, I believe that most of the people we have in our church are saved, even though they're carnal. I believe they're saved. I, I, I just um, I think that they don't know how to confront carnality. They don't know how to get over living a carnal life. And so uh, uh, there have been some attempts to deal with that in the church. Um, the hyperfaith movement, I think, was, was one of those attempts. And um, the positive confession movement was uh, one of those attempts. Sloppy grace is another to tell people, oh, God understands about your sin, and God knows you're a human being, and God knows your, your weaknesses. No, friend, if there's sin in a person's life, God does not understand that because sin killed his son. And God does not understand that, and he's not going to tolerate it. Uh, there are very, various forms of discipleship have been developed, uh, all kinds of uh, attempts to address this thing. But uh, to me, to me, the only thing that we can do is to confront the issues. We have to confront the issues. And uh, glossing them over or sticking our head in the sand or looking the other way is not going to get the carnality out of the church. The true brutal truth of the matter is that the church needs deliverance. It needs deliverance. Now, uh, I, I hesitated to even include that word in my presentation, deliverance. Because there is so much flaky stuff going on out there in the name of deliverance until when you say the very word, especially to preachers, they'll shut you off just like that. And here are the reasons they'll shut you off. Number one, they don't know how to do deliverance and they don't understand deliverance. And what we don't understand or what we don't know how to do, usually we resist and we reject. That's one of the problems. The other problem is there's been so much flakiness that go on in the name of deliverance until preachers just don't want any more to do with flakiness. And so we throw the baby out with the bathwater. But a lack of knowledge and the flakiness involved in the ministry of deliverance are no excuses for us to avoid something that needs to be done in the body of Christ. We absolutely have to do it. And so Cleansing Stream is a deliverance ministry. Uh, we do not use the word deliverance. We don't even talk about deliverance. We talk about cleansing. And that way uh, people will, uh, will not prejudge or form uh, opinions that might um, prevent them from going through this process. And um, so I want to talk to you about Cleansing Stream and I want to show you how Cleansing Stream can address the situation of carnality in the church. I'd like for you to look with me at the book of Galatians. Um, I want to read a scripture here from chapter 5. Paul is writing to a church. So these words are written to those within the church, not those without the church. Paul says here in Galatians 5, 16, I say then, and I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust of the, fle for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, why is Paul writing this to a church? I'm going to tell you why he's writing this to the church, because these works of the flesh are in the church. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires, and if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, and let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You know what we've done? The stab that we've made at uh, helping people deal with their carnality? 
we have told them you must crucify the old man. And so they get down at an altar and they go through a confessional and they get up and they think the old man is dead when in fact he's only in a coma. Get that person in the right situation, the right circumstance, and that man will come to life. There will be a resurrection, I promise you. And uh, so the person then uh, who thinks they have crucified the, the flesh suddenly find this flesh is very much alive and doing some of these works of the flesh. And they don't know how to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so Cleansing Stream gives them tools whereby they can not only crucify the flesh because uh, the flesh requires multiple crucifixions. And um, uh, so we're, we're going to teach them how to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the first thing that we teach uh, in Cleansing Stream is the concept of alignment. Alignment. Now I'm going to tell you what alignment is in a moment. But let me just say to you that that um, according to Hebrews chapter 4, that we are made up, well really 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 tells us that we're made up spirit, soul, and body. Paul says, I pray that God would preserve you holy, W-H-O-L-Y, a spirit, soul, and body. And the, the writer of Hebrews here picks up this concept of the spirit and soul. And I think that one of the problems that we've had in church for a number of years is we don't understand that there is a delineation in Scripture between the spirit and the soul of man. We've always, uh, or many of us, have come to the, the understanding or we have the understanding that maybe these two things are somehow the same. But I assure you that Scripture teaches that these two things are separate. You'll get a clear picture of this in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. The writer of the Hebrews says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest. He's talk of, talking about Israel not entering into the promised land and into the rest. And so he says, Let us be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, here is a picture of an individual. When Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, they were created in God's image and likeness. Would you agree? Chapter 1, God said, Let us make man in our image. Well, the question becomes then, what is God's image? What does God look like? Does He look like you? Does He look like me? Well, no, He doesn't look like us. We look like Him. Thank God He doesn't look like us. We look like Him. Well, what is God's image? What is God? You remember the woman at the well that came to get water one day and Jesus was there? And she got into a discussion about who's right, the Baptist or the Methodist? She said, who's right? You, you Jews say we ought to go up to Jerusalem to worship. My forefathers say we ought to go up here on top of Mount Gerizim. And they were at the foot of Mount Gerizim and said, who's right? And Jesus said to her, neither. God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so if God is a spirit and He creates man in His image and likeness, then man was created a spiritual being. Would you agree? That's what the Scripture says in Genesis chapter 1. I got into a discussion with Mike Brown about the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2. And I ran all this by him. And he gave me the standard theological professor's perspective on Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And I said, well, I don't quite see it that way, Mike. And he says, well, you know, I'm just telling you the way it is. And I said, were you there? 
And he said, well, no. I said, were any of your professors there? And he said, no. I said, well, neither, neither was I, contrary to popular opinion. So I said, really, the bottom line is, Mike, that you don't know any more about creation than I do or anybody else that reads the Scripture. So I said, I'm going to take it literally as it is. And it says in chapter 1 that God created a man in his image and likeness. Now, we know that God is a spirit. And I believe he created Adam and Eve as spiritual beings. Because he didn't form their body until chapter 2. In fact, if you look at the Hebrew word create and the Hebrew word translated form in chapter 2, there's a difference between those two words. The word translated create in chapter 1 means to make something out of nothing. The Hebrew word that's translated formed in chapter 2, where uh, uh, God made Adam's body out of the ground, means to make something out of something. So it's two separate things. And so I, here's what I believe happened. You can believe what you want to. Let me tell you about, about uh, opinions. Opinions are like garbage cans. Everybody's got them, and they all stink. And so I'm going to give you my garbage can right now. Can I prove it? No more than what I just said. Can you disprove it? No more than what I just said. And uh, so I'm, I'm just going to challenge you to think about this. So I believe that God created Adam and Eve, spiritual beings, and gave them a soul which is their mind, will, and emotions. I believe they felt and thought and had a will just like God did or does. And then uh, in Genesis 2, God formed uh, a body for them and uh, breathed what he had created in chapter 1 into what he'd formed in chapter 2, and man became a living being, walking around just like we are today. And everything was cool. Problem. Genesis 3, Satan comes to man and says to Eve, has God really said that you can't eat of all this stuff in the garden? Look at this. This fruit uh, that's on this particular tree right here that you say God says you can't eat of, that fruit looks just as good as any other fruit, doesn't it? And uh, Eve's soul kicks in, and um, her senses kick in, her eyes, she sees it, and uh, she said, yes, it looks good. And uh, her soul begins to, uh, to reason, her mind begins to reason, and hell uh, convinces her <clears throat> that she should eat this fruit, and she does. Well, God has said to her, the day you eat that fruit, you're going to die. Is that what God said? He said that. He said that. And Satan said, you won't die. And so Eve had a choice, and she made a choice. It was a matter of her will. She ate the fruit, she gave it to Adam, and he ate it. And, um, and as a result, we're now living with the devastation that was caused there. But here's what happened when Adam and Eve ate that fruit. Did they die? Hmm? Absolutely they died. Some of you are going this way. Some of you are going, yeah, they died. When they ate the fruit, they died. God said, if you eat it, you're going to die. Not later, but then. Well, how did they die? The Bible, in Genesis 5, it says Adam's lived to be 930 years old. Did Adam die in Genesis 3? Absolutely. How did he die? He died spiritually. He died spiritually at that moment in time. And as a result, every one of us are born dead spiritually until we're born again. We're born again. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. Until we're born again, guess how we live? We live according to what we think, what we feel, and what we desire. We live by our five senses. What looks good, smells good, tastes good, sounds good, that's what we go after. And so, the, the problem is, in my situation, I was 21 years old when I got saved. I was a heathen for 21 years. And I was not a miserable heathen. I didn't have a crisis in my life. I was going to, well, I had a crisis, it was sin, but to me it was no crisis. I was happy, I was parting my way right to hell, and I was having a ball. I was not miserable. I had a smile on my face, and I was having one big ball. And I went to a church one night, and a guy told me that the person that lived like I did was going to hell, and he described hell, and I decided that would be a drag. And I wasn't emotional about it. I wasn't emotional about it. So I got up out of my seat, and I went down to the altar, and I got on my knees, and I said, God, this guy says that I'm a crud. And, you know, in light of everything he's talked about, I will agree that I'm a crud. 
and uh, that I'm going to hell and I don't want to go there. And so um, he said, if I'll ask you that you will forgive me and you will save me. And so I said, here's the deal. I'm confessing that I'm everything he said I was and I'm confessing that I believe that you will forgive me because I don't want to go to hell and those are the only options. And so I said, when I get up from here, I'm going to tell everybody that I'm a Christian and if I am not, it's your fault. That was my, my conversion prayer. You have to understand, when I got saved, I was a drill instructor in the Army. And everything was very cut and dried to me. You see, you don't deviate. Everything's cut and dried. And so uh, it was cut and dried deal. So I got up, and in those days, this was back in 1955, in those days you had to bawl and squall and soak the carpet. You had to be soaking wet with sweat. You had to be so hoarse you couldn't speak above a whisper. And then the people knew you were saved. But I didn't have any of that. I didn't even shed a tear. I got up and, I, and, and some of them, they always ask you back in those days, well, did you get anything, brother? And I said, yeah, I got saved. Nobody believed it. Not, they all looked at me like I'd fallen off a turnip truck. Nobody believed I'd gotten saved. But that was from March the 18th, 1955, and I'm still saved today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you something. When that happened to me, suddenly there was something born in me that was absent before. It was a spiritual birth. When I got saved, I was five foot eight inches tall. And I'm still five foot eight, eight inches tall. I'm getting shorter, but I'm five eight right now. I'll tell you right now, nothing happened to my body. I didn't even get goosebumps. Didn't get a goosebump. Nothing happened to my in intellect. I, my IQ is the same after I got saved as it was before I got saved. So nothing happened in my soul. I was spiritually born again. But the problem was this, that I was thrown into an arena with two Goliaths. Little David, two Goliaths. I had a spirit man that was born inside of me that wanted to go after God. But I had a soul and a flesh that wanted to go after carnal things and whatever I wanted to do, that's what I wanted to do. And so these two uh, Goliaths, my soul and my body, were beating up this little Goliath, I'm mean, this little David that had been born inside of me. Spiritual man. And for years, I didn't know what to do about that. And I'm telling you that that's where 99% of our church people are. They're born again, but they don't know how to deal with these two Goliaths. Because you see, they've always lived their life according to how they felt, what they thought, or what they wanted. Now, they're born again and they're, told, they're being told, you, you shouldn't want that, but I want that. Well then, how am I going to deal with that? I want that. My, my appetites, I've always liked that. I'll give you for instance, when I got saved, I loved beer. I mean, I loved beer like a pig loves slop. And I loved cigarettes. And I'm going to tell you right till this day, right till this day, I don't even watch beer commercials because I think I still like beer. It's been 44 years since I tasted it, but I think I still like beer. But I don't watch beer commercials, and I don't drink non-alcoholic beer. Because, and I'll tell you why, because that appeals to that old nature and after I got saved, for three years after I got saved, I wanted a cigarette. I mean, back in those days, they didn't have smoking in non-smoking places in, in uh, traffic terminals and restaurants and all of that. And my favorite time for a cigarette was right after a, a meal. And I'd sit in a restaurant, and invariably the devil would put somebody at the next table, and they'd light up, and that first whiff of smoke would come tantalizing through the atmosphere right up my nose, and I go, Shh. The guy sitting at the table could have been a snaggletooth mule smoking that cigarette. I would have kissed him for a drag off of it. <laughs> I 
I battled that for three solid years. And I'm going to tell you how I quit smoking. I didn't quit smoking because I got deliverance. I quit smoking because of the discipline that had been instilled in me by the U.S. government. That's how I quit. It was white knuckle. And so I didn't know how to get free of these things. You know, one of the greatest things that has ticked me off in my ministry is this that I have laid hands on people that had cigarette habits and prayed for them, and they were instantaneously delivered. <laughs> now, I don't get ticked off because they get delivered. I get ticked off because I didn't. And I think there were reasons for that. God wanted me to go through that discipline for some reason. But the point that I'm making is this, that when we're born again, we're spiritually born again, and we don't know how to conquer the way we think, the way we feel, and our wills have been so weakened by behavior patterns until we can't even obey the Word of God. You see, the problem with our people, friends, is not ignorance of the Word. The problem with our people is they can't obey the Word. And the reason they can't obey the Word is not because they don't want to, but their wills have been weakened over a period of time to the point that they cannot do what they know to do. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans 7 when he said, The things I would do, I do not, and the things I would not are the things that I do. And that's where our people are, and that's why the carnality is in the church. And so we've got to give the people an opportunity to understand how they are put together, how sin works, and how they can overcome this carnality and walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh and enter into this rest. Look with me, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> and maybe I can show it to you a little clearly, more clearly here. Matthew 16, or 11, 28 and 29. And 30. Jesus speaking here, he says this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then 29. Take my yoke upon you and you learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now look at the rest that's here. There is a rest that is given in verse 28. A rest that is given. I believe that rest that is given is salvation. And then in verse 29, there is a rest that is discovered. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is a rest that's given. Then he says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, and you will find rest. So the rest that is given is salvation. Finding rest is sanctification. And it's in this area of finding rest that cleansing stream works. Because you see, our people in our churches that don't know how to walk in the Spirit, they know they should, They're not walking in the Spirit. They are not at rest. And consequently, because they are not at rest, you're not going to be at rest. Have you noticed that? When people have hell going on in their life, they're going to make hell go on in your life. It's a virus. You catch it. And so Jesus... And the scriptures are trying to teach us that there's a way in which we can discover rest. Remember in uh, uh, Hebrews 4, they did not enter into that rest. You know why they didn't enter into that rest? They didn't enter into that rest because they were carnal people. Talking about Israel. So, here's what we need to do if we're going to be cleansed if we're going to become spiritual people. We have to learn to walk in alignment. 
Because you see, when you're born again, you are now restored to your original position of spirit, soul, and body, the place where Adam and Eve were in the beginning before Adam sinned and died spiritually. <clears throat> so what we do in alignment is we teach people how to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So every morning we teach people, you get up in the morning and here's what you do. This is the prayer. Body, you will line up with my soul. Soul, you will line up with my spirit. Spirit, you will line up with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and you will listen to no other spirit and you will be controlled by no other word than the Word of God. Do you understand how we're going to live today? Basically, what you do is you make a decision to take charge of your life. Do people fail? Absolutely. But let me tell you something. Every time they conquer an area in their life, they get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until finally they can get up in the morning and say, Okay, body, listen up. You're going to submit to my soul. Soul, listen up. You're going to submit to my spirit. Spirit, listen up. You're going to submit to the Holy Spirit of God today and no other spirit. You're going to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Have we got the day planned? And I'm going to tell you, friends, we have brought uh, about half of our congregation, about 2,600, 2,700 people through cleansing stream, and they are walking in the Spirit. People ask us all the time here, how do you guys get these people to do all this stuff? We teach them how to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to show you in just a moment some other things that will, will help. See, this thing's been going on now for four and a half years. People want to know why is it so holy around here? Well, to be honest with you, because we don't have time to sin. <laughs> and when we do have time to sin, we don't have the energy. No. No, we've taught our people how to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We've taught them that. And here's why it's so important that people learn to walk in alignment. First of all, they have to walk in alignment in order to hear the voice of God. Let me tell you something, friend. If, you're, if your soul is in control, you're not going to hear the voice of God. Here's what it's going to sound like. God's speaking to you, and God does speak to His people. Did you know that? God does speak to His people. But when we're walking out of alignment and our soul is in the predominant position here instead of our spirit, here's what it says. God speaks to us, and it comes through like this. And say, what do you say there, God? I don't understand a word you're saying. Well, of course you don't, because you're listening to God through your soul. God speaks to you through your spirit. God speaks to you through your spirit. And if you get in alignment, then God's voice can come straight in and be very clearly heard. I'm telling you, God can speak to you very clearly. Very clearly. I've had numerous instances in my life where God has spoken to me very clearly. And I didn't even know anything about alignment at that time, uh, the way they teach it, the way we teach it in Cleansing Stream. I knew it from the sermons that I had prepared. 1987, I was in the Navy. A, a senior commander, ready to make captain, going to the, the, the Bureau of Naval Personnel. I was in a convention in Oklahoma City. God spoke to me, sitting there in a white uniform. God spoke to me sitting way up on the side of a, of a convention center. And he said, you get out of the Navy and go back to church. I said, say what? Get out of the Navy and go back to church. I'm about to do something great in the kingdom of God. And you're invited to the party. They had just read on the floor of the General Council of the Assemblies of God the Declaration of the De Decade of Harvest in the Assemblies of God. And the decade of harvest was going to be 1990 until 2000. It set my heart on fire. I started weeping uncontrollably. I mean, I'm a hard naval officer. And here I am, bawling and squalling and blubbering. My wife's sitting there looking at me. She is embarrassed. In fact, I got out of my seat and on my knees on that floor, which was filthy. When I got up from there, that white uniform looked like I had been in a fight in a dead-end alley brawl. And we got back to the hotel. My wife said, what in the world is wrong with you? 
And I said, God just spoke to me back there in that Coliseum and said that I was supposed to get out of the Navy. She said, whoa, whoa, no, no, why you just? She didn't want to go back. She knew what was waiting back in church, you know. And I said, God told me to go back to church, honey. And she said, we'll have to pray about this. <laughs> and so we did. We fasted and prayed, and God spoke to us clearly. And he had already spoken to me. And um, so we got out of the Navy. I'm, I was 54 years old. Friend, I'm going to tell you, you don't make a career change at 54. I mean, how many churches are going to want a guy 54 years old? You know what churches want? They want a 29-year-old Ph.D. with 30 years of experience. <laughs> but God gave me a wonderful church because He spoke to me. In fact, I went up and tried out for this church and accepted it and was driving back to Pensacola. And I said, Shirley, I've got to call the chief of chaplains and tell him that I've accepted a church while on active duty. And she said, what do you think he's going to say? And I said, I have no earthly idea. This guy's an admiral, Catholic. So I came back down here to Pensacola, picked up the phone and called him. I'd known him when he was a commander. His name is John McNamara. I said, John, I need mercy. And he said, what? And I, in his admiral voice, you know, what? And I said, um, um, I went up to Albany, Georgia and accepted a church last night. He said, you did what? I said, I accepted a church last night. He said, may I remind you that you are on active duty? And I said, you don't have to remind me. I've been wrestling with it all night. And he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to get me out of the Navy. And so there was a long pause, and then he said, call this number. He gave me the number, and um, it takes nine months to process out of the Navy in retirement. And that was on September, no, October the 6th. And on December the 4th, I had my retirement ceremony. Heard from God. We went to Albany, bought this nice house. My wife loved this house. Even had a flagpole. She wanted a flagpole. Had a flagpole. I mean, this was the house. I dragged her all over the world in the military, in the Army, and in the Navy. And now we found the house, and it had the flagpole. And so we were in that house five years, and one day I was coming home, God said, sell this house. I said, you really have a sense of humor, Father. You'll get me killed. There must be a better way for you to get me to heaven than for me to tell my wife about this house. You sell the house. I heard it very clearly, so I came in and I told Shirley, I said, Shirley, God told me to sell this house. She said, you crazy as a loon. <laughs> She said, I'm not selling this house. And I said, well, I'm just telling you what God said. And so finally she said, well, I'll pray. And so she prayed. And she said, all right, we'll put it on the market, but we're not putting a sign in the yard. We're not advertising. We'll just put it on the market with a realtor. And if it sells, fine. If not, fine. So I said, fine, because I escaped with my life. <laughs> <laughs> Ten days later, a couple walked in and said, how much wants for this house? I told them. They said, okay. I said, you have to pay the closing costs too. And they said, okay. And so my wife was homeless. <laughs> Just that quick. And she looked at me in astonishment and said, you did hear from God. And we did. And eight months later, that house was flooded underwater. Underwater. December of 94, I'm driving to work. Happy as a dead pig in a mud hole. And out of the clear blue, God speaks to me and says, you're finished here. I said, say what, man? You're finished here. I had a six-figure salary package, buddy. And I was turning 62, then 1995, and I was set for life. I had five other guys. Newman Ty was one of them, and they did all the work. I came in, preached, and went and played golf, went fishing, did whatever I wanted. They did the work, and I got the glory. And... Um, <laughs> Had a nice six-figure salary package, and God here is telling me that I'm finished. I mean, uh, you don't want to hear stuff like that early in the morning, even before you've had a cup of coffee. You don't want to hear it any time. I'm telling you, it's 62. But you know what? I wanted revival. And that church wasn't interested in revival, and God in his mind knew that this church was going to be in revival, and so he was trying to get me from there to here. 
And if I had been walking in alignment, I'm going to tell you it would have come through like, and I would have been sitting up there, probably more sheep bit than I've ever been in my life. But I'm telling you, if you walk in alignment, you'll hear the voice of God. And we need to teach people to do that. Secondly, we need to walk in alignment for protection. For protection. We get out of alignment, we open ourselves up to the attack of the enemy. And the reason a lot of our people are under satanic attack is because they're not walking in alignment. Because you see, it's the spirit part of man that's covered by the blood. It's not that old flesh, and it's not that old soul. God can't cover sneaking thinking. And God certainly can't harness this flesh. This flesh is a wild man. And um, so when we stay under, uh, stay in alignment, we stay under the protection of the blood and, uh, and for protection. Thirdly, we walk in alignment in order to grow spiritually. How many of you would like to see your people grow spiritually by leaps and bounds? Get them in alignment, and I mean they can grow by leaps and bounds. You see this guy right here? See him? This was a heathen. 28 years, alcohol, drugs, just a woman chaser, the, the crud of the earth. This guy right here. <laughs> What's it been, three years, Bill? Four years. Four years ago, right after the revival started, this guy got saved and cleaned up. And, and this guy, this guy has been through our school of ministry and is preaching all over the country. I mean, it took him four years to come from crud to saint and serving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He shadows me like a shadow to keep me out of trouble and to protect me. He, he waits on me hand and foot. He's just a servant, servant. And God's raising this guy up. He's raising this guy up. And you know why he's come that far in four years? I guarantee you, if he had not gone through cleansing stream and cleansing discipleship, he would have never grown to this, this, this level in four years. Amen. He'll tell you that. He'll tell you that. Now he teaches cleansing stream. He not only lives it, he teaches it and preaches all over the country in order to grow spiritually. So, alignment is the first step in cleansing streams. The second step, i got to hurry, is consecration. <clears throat> the definition of consecration is to make or declare sacred or set apart for dedicated or dedicated to the service of God. Paul says to the church in Philippi, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, But what things were gained to me, these things I've counted loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. How many of you would say that Paul had been set aside for a sacred purpose? Guess what? So have you. And guess what? So has everyone God saved in your church. They've been set aside. Problem problem. They're not consecrated. Some of us in this room are not consecrated. I've discovered that there are three areas in which people need consecration in their lives. Every time I counsel someone, by the way, the cleansing stream has reduced our counseling load in this church by 50%. So we've taught, we've taught people how to handle their problems. <coughs> We've discovered that there are three areas that people have problems in in their Christian walk. The first area is in material things. Material things. Stuff gets between our people and God. Stuff gets between you and me and God. Do you know that? We teach our people not that God owns 10%, but that God owns all of it. God said, all the silver and gold are mine. If all of it's his, that leaves nothing left over. All of it's God's. Do you know how we sustain this revival financially? We don't sustain it through the gifts 
and the offerings that come in through revival crowds, those are very, very insignificant in the scheme of things. Our budget here is $9 million a year. We spent three and a half, three point seven million dollars building this building for revival overflow. We would have never built this building had it not been for revival. And do you know how we're able to do this? Because our people give. Over eighty percent of this congregation tithes. That's how we pay the bills. And the reason they tithe is because we've taught them that everything they have belongs to God. The house they live in is their house. It's God's house. The car they drive is not their car. It's God's car. The clothes they wear is not their clothes. They're God's clothes. Everything we have belongs to God. And if you can get stuff out from between a person and God, you'd be surprised how rapidly that person, how many problems disappear in that person's life. You'll hear people say, well, I can't tithe, man. I, I can't afford to tithe. When a person says that, there's something between material, material between them and God. When a person says tithing is not biblical, there's something materially between them and God. I promise you. So we teach, them to con we teach people how to consecrate material things. Second thing we teach them is how to consecrate, consecrate relationships. You'd be surprised how many people get in trouble because of relationships. Somebody in your church gets ticked off at you, and they got a relative over there they go spill all their garbage on, and that relative gets ticked off at you, and because of the relationship that they have, or friendship uh, relationship, and pretty soon you've got a rebellion on your hands. And it all came about because relationships were not consecrated. Let me tell you what we teach our people. If your buddy gets ticked off at the pastor and wants to come and dump on you, you tell your buddy, shut your mouth. You shut your mouth. I'm not going to listen to anything about the pastor. You understand? We don't tolerate that in this church. Now you zip it up or else you go out of here and you leave. That's what our people tell people. They don't let friendship get in the way. They don't, they don't let relationships get in the way. When people come to the altar over there uh, on, on, during the revival, you'll hear us tell them, if you're in a relationship right now, no, this is not for married people obviously, but if you're in a relationship right now where you're saved and the other person isn't, you break it off and break it off now. Break it off now. We had a, a guy and a girl that were living together came here to the revival. Steve preached and the girl came down the, to the altar and got saved. We told them that, they couldn't, uh, that, that people couldn't live like that and be Christians. She got up and walked back there and stuck her finger in Tarzan's face and said, It's over! And he was absolutely blown away. He said, Well, where am I going to stay tonight? And she said, Not with me. And that's why we have to have guards because Tarzan gets ticked off when he hears messages like that. They don't like that stuff. But you consecrate relationships. How many times have you seen it, Pastor, where a husband or wife gets cold in the Lord and she says, well, I'm not going to church today and the husband stays home with her and pretty soon he's cold in the Lord and both of them are backslidden and out the door. How many times have you done that or seen that? I'm going to tell you what I did. My wife led me to the Lord. She was a Christian when she married me. I was a heathen. And she married me. Best thing that ever happened to me outside of salvation. She led me to the Lord. And she, she's a wonderful Christian woman, beautiful woman. Got all the graces in the world. She's going to heaven. But I told her one day, not too long ago, I said, listen, listen up, Shirley. I said, I just want to inform you of something. If you ever decide to backslide and go to hell, I ain't going with you. You understand? I love you, but I ain't going. I'm going to heaven. I just felt like that day that I wanted to just let everybody know I was going to heaven. And so I started with her. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't go to hell with you or anybody else. You understand that, sweetie? I love you, but I ain't going to hell with you. Just thought I'd let you know that right up front. Relationships. You get them consecrated, man. You get those relationships consecrated, it'll take a load of burden off, you see, because there ain't nobody more important than Jesus when those relationships are consecrated. Now, I'm not saying you can't have relationships. I'm just saying that there's a limit. Okay? 
And the limit is this. If my relationship with you is going to affect me in a detrimental way spiritually, then our relationship is over, Jack. You hit the road. We don't have anything to talk about. But you know what we, what we do? We try to model coddle people and we try to, you know, they'll get mad at you as a pastor and you'll, you'll spend days and weeks with ulcers and lose sleep trying to get this person, you know. What you need to do is just consecrate them and forget about them. Most pastors spend 90% of their time with 10% of their people. Let me tell you something, pastor. You ain't going to get them to heaven anyway. So release them and put your time into those that, that are, are worthwhile and those that are going after God and those that are going to get on board and let the rest of them go. If they go to hell, it's not your fault. Get off that guilt trip, man. That's a trick of the devil. He wants to drain all your energy with this old sourpuss over here that's been in the church 25 years. Got to have a baba and a diety change every day. Let me ask you something. If you came over to my house and we were sitting in my den talking and I said, would you excuse me? I, I, I think I, I hear my son back here in the bedroom and I need to go change him and give him his baba. And so I'm gone 15 minutes and I come back and I say, he's okay now. And you say, I, well, uh, uh, how old is your son? At 43? <laughs> you would look at me and say, 43 and you're changing his diaper and giving him a baba? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I love him. Is he healthy? Yeah, he's healthy. He weighs 250 pounds. <laughs> we never do that in the physical. But in the spiritual, we do it all the time. Just wean them. Wean them. They won't die. I promise you, they won't die. They're too mean to die. And then we teach people how to concentrate, uh, con concentrate, consecrate themselves. Did you know the biggest thing that gets between us and God is us? <laughs> you see, I got an agenda and so do you. But what are we going to do with that agenda? Your people's got agendas too, and that's part of their problem. Their agenda is their agenda instead of God's agenda. And so one of the things we teach people here is, hey, your agenda doesn't count. Only God's agenda counts. What does God want to do? If God wants to keep this revival going for another 10 years, guess what? We're going to do it another 10 years because we don't have an agenda. That's it. That's it. So we consecrate ourselves. Is it difficult? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll miss your sitcom. And you'll miss football game. I don't think in four and a half years that I've sat down and seen an entire football game. And before that, I watched every one of them that I could get my eyeballs on. I retired here to play golf, as I told you. I think I played golf nine times in four and a half years, and I live on a golf course. I'm just not interested right now. I have two sets of pink clubs, and no, you cannot have them. the way it goes. <laughs> I may want to play someday, but right now I'm not interested in God. I'm, I'm interested in what God's interested in. And God could give a rip about God. He could. Just doesn't care about it. And so we consecrate material things, relationships, and self. The third area of cleansing stream that we teach people in is, has to do with words. Words have power. You know and I know that the worlds were created with words. God didn't get him a workshop and build all of this. He just spoke and the worlds came into existence. And um, Jesus came and he spoke and basically what Jesus did was he said the amen to what God said. He just said the amen to what God said. God said, 
Son, the world has gotten itself into a mess down there, and I've already determined that you're a lamb that's been slain from before the foundations of the earth. What do you think about that? And Jesus said, Amen. You see, Amen is not a word to get a response from an audience. Amen means, so be it. And so, God said, uh, they're in a mess down there, you know, and I've already in my mind had you as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. What do you think about that? And Jesus said, so be it. Well, I'm going to send you from heaven, and I'm going to send you down there to that rotten earth, and uh, people are going to hate your guts. And Jesus said, well, so be it. And God said, not only are they going to do that, but they're going to ridicule you, and they're going to falsely accuse you, and, and they're ultimately going to arrest you and give you a, a false trial, and they're going to lie on you like a horse thief, and they're going to crucify you. And Jesus said, so be it. So be it. There's power in the Word, you see. You and I are redeemed right now because of the power of words. Jesus said, so be it. You remember when he was in the garden and he was praying? He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And about that time, God said, not my will. And Jesus said, then not my will, but yours be done. So be it. And that's when he went to the cross. That's Jesus, really, his cross was right there in Gethsemane. Did he go to the cross? Yes, he did. But the real battle was won right there, and it was won through words, through words. And there's power in our words as well. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 2 says that we are trapped or in bondage by the words of our own mouth. You see, there are words that are spoken over us or words that we spoke, speak over ourselves or over our families or our spouses, and that opens the door for hell to come in and set up a stronghold in a person's life. For instance, a married couple get into a heated discussion. Well, let's just get a divorce. You just opened the door by, by making that suggestion. You just gave hell the privilege to come in and, and create a stronghold that will work against your marriage and, and, and po probably cause it to end up in divorce. Let me tell you what I did with my wife. When we got married, and we've been married 44 years, uh, what, one thing that I said to her, I said, Honey, divorce is not an option. So you can find the dictionary with that page on it, and you can tear it out because it doesn't apply. And every once in a while, you know, I'll just remind her, the fact that it wasn't long ago, I said to her, I said, look right here, look here, look here. You see this? This is the last thing you're going to see on the face of this earth. You understand me? This is it. There ain't no other options. This is it, baby. Got it? This is it right here. We're just establishing once again, you know, that hell ain't getting its, it's foot in our, in our house. Now, we've been married 44 years. If we had opportunities to get divorced, 44 of them. <laughs> At least one a year. We just haven't uh, talked about it nor exercised any options. And we've not opened the door for hell to come in and, and destroy our relationship. We tell kids sometimes, Man, you're, you'll never amount to anything. Let me tell you, don't ever tell a kid that. You'll create a monster. You'll create a monster. My mother used to tell me, I was raised on a sharecropper's farm over in Mississippi. Object to poverty. I mean the worst kind of poverty. And I figured out by the time I was eight years old, this is a drag. I don't want to do this. And so my mother would send me out to the garden to hoe the vegetables, and I'd go out and cut them every one down. She'd beat the living daylights out of me and say, you'll never amount to a hill of beans. My mother opened the door for a curse in my life. She said, I never amount to a hill of beans. A hill of beans, if you weren't born on a farm, a hill of beans is one stalk of bean that comes from one bean spread, and it will feed you not even one good meal. And so what she was saying was, you're going to starve to death, buddy. You're so sorry until you're going to starve to death. Now, my mother loved me. I was her baby. Six kids, I'm the youngest one, and she loved me. She did not willfully or intentionally produce a curse on, or, or pronounce a curse on me, but in effect, that's what she did. Because, you see, those kinds of words will produce two kinds of responses internally in a kid. It will either destroy that kid's initiative to say, well, I guess that's right. 
And hell will take it and say, your mother said you'd never amount to a hill of beans, therefore you'll never amount to a hill of beans. And a kid will grow up with an inferiority complex and never accomplish anything because hell has been given an opportunity to get in that kid's life. Or the other op uh, uh, extreme is this, that it will create a monster. It will cause a kid to decide, hey, hide and watch. And that's what he did with me. My mother said, you'll never amount to a hill of beans. And I, I can remember as a little kid, I'd say, you just wait. When I get off this cotton picking farm, you just wait. And consequently, I'm a task oriented person. I'm not a people oriented person, as you probably have already gathered. <laughs> and so I have to get people, people around me. Because if I don't, I just leave footprints on people. Because I don't care what you feel like, I just want this job done. Okay? And I don't want excuses. There are no excuses. We are going to do this job. And, um, you know, I fight this thing. I'm 66 years old. I fight this thing every day I live. The other day I was having to deal with a problem. My wife, she could tell, you know, we've been married 44 years. She can tell. And she said, um, uh, what's going on? I said, nothing. <laughs> and so as I started out the door, she said, remember, you are a pastor and not a naval officer. Because I had that killer look, you know. <laughs> Bring that trident submarine up here. We're going to nuke somebody. <laughs> I had that look. And it goes back there to that thing. And, and you know, I constantly have to help people. And one of the reasons God put him in my life is because he is so mercy. I mean, people could sell him snowballs in Alaska. Any derelict off the street will come in and say, I, I just, you know, <laughs> he'll bring him to me and say, oh, Pastor, we got to help this guy. I said, that's a con artist, man. <laughs> oh, we got to, we got to help him. And so, so the next thing I know, I got my, how much? <laughs> this guy's cost the kingdom a ton of money. But God gives me people like that because, you see, I'm dealing with that thing that was introduced to me. I fight it right until this very day. Words, I'm telling you, words. You've got to watch your words because words can open the door to the entrance of demonic influence. Let me ask you this. Let me show you the power of words. If Satan had the power to kill mankind and destroy mankind, why did he get in a conversation with Eve? Hmm? Because he doesn't have the power to destroy mankind. So he gets in a conversation and uses the power of words to convince Eve to rebel against God. And that's why you and I have gotten the mess we were in as a, as a sinner. And why we deal with some of the trash we deal with right now is because of words. Words. Satan's a liar and the father of all lies. He has, he has no capability. Read John 8, 44. He has no capability of telling the truth. Everything he says advances the kingdom of darkness. Everything God says advances the kingdom of light. We've come out of the kingdom of darkness. We know how to survive in that kingdom of darkness. We have to learn how to live in the kingdom of light. So we have to change the way we talk. And we have to be able to understand when Satan's lying. How many of you would like to know uh, a way of telling when Satan's lying? I'll give you a surefire way. You can tell when Satan is lying when his lips are moving. <laughs> if he's talking, he's lying. Because he can't tell the truth. Words. Words. And then the fourth area of cleansing stream has to do with cleansing itself. Turn, and i gotta, I got to hurry. <laughs> I'm going to take you over here if I don't. And I know you're sick of this already. Keep going, brother. Don't encourage me. <laughs> Second Timothy 2. Let me tell you what we teach people. We teach people when you sin, willfully sin, you give Satan a foothold in your life. Whatever area it is you, you willfully sin in, that's where you give Satan a foothold in your life. 
Now I'm going to talk about de demon possession in a moment, but not right here. Okay? Look at 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2. Paul is uh, impressing upon Timothy what a servant of the Lord should be. And he says, verse 24, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition to themselves. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what Paul said? Paul says that Satan can take believers in a snare to do his will. Say, I don't believe that. Then explain to me why you have the hell in your church you have. Why do you have those people in your church that are as mean as a snake? I'm telling you, because there are strongholds in their lives Areas in their lives where they've opened themselves up and given hell control of a certain area of their life. Gossip. Unforgiveness. See, we don't really consider those to be big sins, and yet they tear our churches all to pieces. Gossip and unforgiveness tears the church up quicker than adultery or fornication does. But you see, adultery and fornication are the biggies. And gossip and forgiveness, there's so much of that in church until we've learned to tolerate it and we think it's normal. But it's not normal. It's not normal. During membership class here, I teach uh, our new members, if you gossip, I'll cut your tongue out. <laughs> These people are people that have given hell a place in their life. And that's why Paul's teaching Timothy what well, he's teaching him here. He says these people are in opposition to themselves. And you need to correct them. You need to correct them. If perchance God will grant them repentance so they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Notice, friends, Paul is not saying now, Timothy, what you need to do is get a big bottle of oil and call them up and lay hands on them and anoint them and cast the devil out. That's not what he says. That's not what he says. And I'm going to show you in a minute that we're to cleanse ourselves. We're to cleanse ourselves. Um, I'm going to skip James 1, 12 to 16, and I'm going to go to Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27 says this, Give no place to the devil. Now, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and so if he says, give no place to the devil, it must be possible for a Christian to give place to the devil, else why in the world would Paul caution them not to do that? See, if you can't do something, then why do you need any instructions about it? You know, okay, let's go to the moon as an astronaut. I don't need any instructions about that, because I ain't going to do that. So I don't need any instructions about going to the moon. But if there's a possibility of my going to the moon, then I need instructions, right? So Paul says, give no place to the devil. This word translated place in the Greek is the Greek word topos, from which we get our English word topography. So Paul is saying, do not give Satan a definite location in your life. You see, the reason hell is in the church is because Christians have given places in their lives to the devil so the devil can get there and influence them in that particular area of their life. And you start dealing with them, and you'll find out that hell's there because hell will come right out against you. Big time. Big time. Some of you have had the experience. Now, I'm not suggesting... That a, demon can, uh, that a Christian can be demon-possessed. Somebody asked Jack Hayford one time, do you believe a Christian can have a demon? And Jack said, who wants one? <laughs> Christian can't be demon-possessed. The Holy Spirit's not interested in coexistence. The Holy Spirit's not interested in duplex living. 
The Holy Spirit wants a whole house and go to have the whole house or he ain't staying. Just that simple. He's out of there. You see, possession has to do with who controls the spirit of man. That's what demon possession is. Who controls the spirit of man? If hell controls the spirit of man, then you've got a demon possessed person. If hell doesn't control the spiritual area of a person, then that person, if they have a, a control point in their life, demonic control point, it is in their soul and it is a bondage. It's not possession. And the truth of the matter is that we have thousands and millions of people in our churches with bondages in their soul. The way they think, the way they feel, and the way they decide. And so cleansing stream will cleanse them of that. So how do I cleanse myself? There, there are two questions. From what do I cleanse myself and how do I cleanse myself? Here's the answer to what, what do I, from what do I cleanse myself? From soulish responses. From soulish responses. Can I, can I just take a moment and give you a classic Old Testament example of Genesis 16? You can read it when you get home. In fact, I'll make it so interesting you will read it when you get home. It's the story of uh, Abraham and Sarah. God has said to them, you're going to have a kid. And Sarah fell out laughing. <laughs> God, God, we're going to have a kid. She, she said, look at me, God. And Abraham, Abraham's battery's been dead 10 years. What are you talking about? A kid. You've you got to be out of your ever-loving mind. Sarah just said, she's, she's hysterical. <laughs> a kid, you're talking. You're talking a kid. My goodness, God. And she tells Abraham, said, God thinks you and I are going to have a kid, old boy. And I'm going to tell you, I know you. I've been, I've been sleeping in your tent for a long time, and you ain't having no kid. Neither am I. Because I ain't interested. <laughs> and you can't, you ain't able. <laughs> so it ain't going to happen, Abraham. And then she got to thinking about that, and one day she said, uh, Well, I think I know how this can happen. So I'm going to help God. So she goes to Abraham and said, Abraham said, um, you know, God said we we're going to have a child. said, um, have you noticed Hagar, my concubine, my, my servant girl? And Abraham said, uh-huh, I, I paid attention to her a couple of times. <laughs> and Sarah said, well, you know, um, I, I can't have a baby. You know that. And um, she said, uh, why don't you think about taking Hagar um, and, and, and have the baby with Hagar. Maybe, some, maybe something can be worked out there. And, and Abraham said, uh, well, let me think about it. He said, okay, I thought about it. <laughs> That'll be good. That'll be okay. And so, um, so um, um, sure enough, Hagar cranks Abraham's battery, charges it, and it produces Ishmael. But the problem is that Ishmael is not the son of promise. Let me tell you something, friends. When you get into a soulish response, you produce an Ishmael every single time. And let me tell you, that Ishmael that was produced there is still a thorn in the side of that son of promise until this day. Because it was through Ishmael the, Arab, the, 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 uh, the Arabic uh, nations came. And uh, it has far-reaching consequences. And so what do we need deliverance from? From soulish responses. Later on, they had Isaac, son of promise. And here's what God told Abraham to do. He said, you take that soulish response and you cast it out. And you take the son of the spiritual response and you offer it up. And friend, when you cast out the Ishmael and you offer up the Isaac, you're going to walk in alignment, you're going to walk in consecration, you're going to talk right, you're going to act right, you're going to live right, and hell's never going to get an entrance into your life. But as sure as you get to, to dealing with this um, uh, soulish response, is going to get you in trouble. Now, the second thing is, how do I cleanse myself? Second Timothy again, and I'm finishing. Chapter 2, 
and verse 22. Paul says, flee youthful lust. Paul's not talking about just a young person here because uh, these lusts are things that find their way into our lives probably when we're young because we're not smart enough to know that these things are dangerous and so they become patterns of behaviors in our lives. Paul says, flee those things, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and all of those things. And uh, then he says, uh, down here in verse 25, receive correction. Receive correction. So we teach people in the cleansing segment of Cleansing Stream that as a servant of the Lord, we must in humility correct those who are opposing themselves. We must do that. We must do that. And then we teach them to stop opposing themselves. And here's how they do it. They do it through, first of all, knowing the truth and then repenting. Knowing the truth and then repenting. And then they renounce. We teach them to renounce the legal right of this thing to have a hold in their life. And then by the authority in Jesus' name and the anointing, we destroy the yoke of bondage in their life and watch them recover. And that's what Cleansing Stream is about. Okay? Now, the way we do Cleansing Stream, we do it in 12 weeks because we have to accelerate things here. In, in, um, in uh, Van Nuys, they, um, they do Cleansing Stream in five months. And um, yeah. So I've got some, if you're interested in Cleansing Stream, I have leadership kits in the, um, in the, the um, product tent. They're $120 cash, they're $125 credit card. We don't make a dime on those, that's not what we're here for. We're here simply to provide you with resources if you're interested. We have the leadership kits that's described in this brochure out in the tent. And you can pick those up and take them with you. It consists of a leader's guide, a student's workbooks. There are four workbooks, one for each one of these areas that I just talked to you about. There are some audios and some textbooks. There are three textbooks and there are four videos. Four videos. Um, uh, I have to warn you that the first video on a line that I teach, and um, so if you've had enough of me, you wouldn't want to get that, but um, anyway. Um, we have some Canadian brethren here, and I also have the Canadian um, representative of Cleansing Stream with us, and so David, would you come up here, please? And um, David, the, the Canadian brethren, if, I'm going to give David uh, the, these um, brochures for the Canadians, and if you folks that want a brochure from Canada, if you'll come right here, this is the guy. And the, the rest of you, if you want a brochure, I'm going to uh, have Bill pass these out. Just raise your hand, and he'll pass them down. While he's doing that, um, do you have any questions that you'd like to, to pose to me, either about Cleansing Stream or anything else we do here? <laughs> okay, he said talk about the retreat. The, um, the, I, I omitted that because of time. But uh, the Cleansing Stream seminar... Uh, culminates with a um, uh, culminates with a uh, retreat. Uh, it's a Friday night and Saturday retreat where we actually do the um, the the um, cleansing of the of the individual, the deliverance. We have anointed people that do that, and uh, there are cleansing stream uh, retreats all over the country. And uh, that 800 number that you have in your brochure, you can call there and find out where the nearest cleansing stream retreat is to you, and you can go there and take your people there, and uh, they will get them delivered. Okay? Any other questions? Age limit. We don't allow anyone here under 18. We're developing something for teenagers, but we don't have it done yet. But we don't allow anyone in here under 18. Yes, sir. The discipleship, cleansing discipleship program that follows this, uh, you can get the information from the, uh, the 800 number that's in the brochure there. And I encourage you, get your people through cleansing discipleship because it has a tremendous um, impact on people's lives, okay? Yes, sir. We have one in May. May and December, we have, we have retreats here, okay? 
Yes. Yes. Until you get people trained in your church to do the retreat, that's what you should do. Did I see Pastor Michelle Rembrandt here from Ambali, France? Ah, oh, Pastor, how are you? God bless you. Thank you. How are you? It's good to see you.